Hello, everyone, and welcome to Odin, Open Dialogue, Ideas, and News, the podcast where we talk about Open Dialogue, Ideas, and News. For many of you, this is going to be the first time you're hearing us, probably because this is the first episode. So before I get into the nitty gritty of explaining why we're here, I'd like to introduce the team, starting with Eric. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm the president of Odin. So I contacted Gazal and Rich over the summer, and I had an idea to start a club, but I didn't know exactly what we were going to do in it. My only idea for it was that I wanted it to improve dialogue among people on campus and get some of the ideas that are happening at Virginia Tech out there to more of an audience. So I started with the idea of a debate club, and then we quickly realized that wasn't exactly what we wanted. And finally, after a lot of talking, we decided to start Odin, where we record podcasts and try to get more dialogue happening on campus and set an example for the rest of the country. Appreciate it, Eric. Next up, we have Guzal. Hi, guys. My name is Guzal, and I'm also a senior here at Virginia Tech. I am majoring in national security and foreign affairs, and my second degree is in Russian. So over the summer, my good friend Eric texted me with um, a proposition. So the exact text said, hey, I got a proposition for you. You have time for a call later today or sometime this week. And I was like, yes. And he said, I want to start a debate club to push political discussions in a healthier direction. And I want you to be on the exact board if you have the time. If you're too busy this next year, I completely understand. And here we are several months later. Our club has finally been finalized and we're recording our first podcast. And I'm really excited to get started. Thank you, Guzal. I appreciate it. To my right here, we have Addison. Hey guys, I'm Addison. I'm the chief editor of Odin. I got into this after Eric and Gazal, two of our other fellow executives, contacted me. They said they wanted to start something that helped people get through the expanse of difficult dialogue and ideas and just all that's going on in our culture right now, and I thought that was a great idea. So I'm just really interested in exploring those ideas and figuring out how we can make our society more collaborative. Thank you. And next we have Max. Hi there, everybody. I'm Max Carpenter. I am a junior physics major here at Tech. Um, I got roped into this podcast because Rich said they needed a fifth member and it was something he thought I might enjoy. And he's right. It's it's a lot of fun. I love talking about ideas. Um, open dialogue and discourse are all very wonderful things. Um, I am the official audio wizard of, of Odin. So I, I handle the levels and all of that. Um, but if that's just cause we needed an official name for the, for the club organization, I'm actually a wizard. Don't tell anyone, but yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, how about you tell us about yourself, Rich? Oh, well, thank you. You've heard my name four or five times by now, but I never introduced myself. I'm Rich Grant, and I am also a Virginia Tech student. Who would have guessed? However, I'm in finance, so that's why my official title in this group is the Sugar Daddy, but you guys can just call me the Treasurer. One of the things that really excites me about Odin is we've talked about dialogue, but more than that is we want to use this as a tool to take abstract ideas, which we're all a really big fan of. We all like to get our philosophy pants on and chat about really deep subjects, but one of the things we might not have done as much as we'd liked is take these abstract concepts and find actionable solutions from them that we can bring to people. And so by forming a podcast where we take ideas that we're passionate about and try to find a way to bring value to the people who listen to it and apply it to your life, it would make us so happy. And so we're really, we're glad you're here. Thank you for listening. All right, so one of the reasons that we started this club is to promote civic engagement more. One thing that I've noticed just in my earlier years in college is I see a lot of good people with good brains checking out of politics because it's just too difficult to talk to. It's just too difficult to talk about with other people. It seems like that's the result of of fearing expressing your opinion. Yeah, definitely. Because before we've had the chance to articulate ourselves... Our ideas really aren't going to be as fleshed out as we'd like them to be. And when there's large repercussions for stating what you think, 
such as judgments from other people or just in general with how divisive politics is, you worry about any statement you make coming back to bite you. It makes it a very high barrier to entry. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm the first to say that I'm probably going to say something that's pretty stupid at one point or another. But I think that's something that people really have have to submit to if we want to have a free space to talk is you have to be able to admit when you're wrong, even if even if it's kind of embarrassing at the time or you might have gotten beat in a discussion or something like that. We have to start admitting that we're wrong and maybe I don't know everything. I think a little more than that, it's reframing it in terms, not in wrong of right, but in terms of we're all humans. And when in a when a conversation is held with the frame of mind, like I'm trying to be right and this person is wrong or vice versa, or maybe this person will convince me they're right or I'm wrong. It changes the dynamics in a manner that I think fosters this sense of resentment. Anytime someone brings up a point that doesn't align with your current values. Rather, what I'd like to focus on is the fact that we all have really great ideas about what we'd like to see in this world that all come from the same place. We have the same needs as human beings, but we have trouble expressing that. Well, we I talked about this once previously, so it seems like a lot of the issues that we see in politics today stem from debating about strategies. I gave this example last time we had talked, but I'm not sure the listeners have heard it. So let's say Jim and Bob are two people who both have a need for security. They both want to know that they're going to be safe. They're going to be all right. But Jim, to meet this need for security, he introduces himself to the entire neighborhood. He meets all the neighbors because he feels safer if he knows the people around him. And that's how he meets his need for security and safety. How does Bob do that? He buys a gun. Two completely different strategies, but they both meet the same underlying need. So what I would really love to see is if we could bring our discussions away from strategies where we're always going to be disagreeing and try to start at the foundation. But I, I, um, I feel like that's kind of the central paradox, though, is that you can take two people given the exact same set of needs, set of... Um, base ideology maybe um of you know moral people wanting to do good things like that but they can take those in two such diametrically opposed directions to me i think that that's one of the biggest challenges to discussion is that you can end up with such opposite stances on i don't know when rational normal people share rational normal beliefs and i I think the the key of being able to view another person like as a human being and as a a thinking feeling person and all that is one of the biggest things that's that's missing from from dialogue and um achieving a sense achieving empathy with the person that you're discussing some discussing these issues with i see that as being one of the most important aspects of any discussion about any any issue so then the question arises, how do we foster that? How does that happen? And why is that not happening? And one of the things that I've been thinking about for the last couple of weeks, since I actually read a really interesting study that was done in about the 1990s, I forget who conducted it, but it was about the moralization of topics. And it, what the study discusses is moralization tends to occur when you take a topic and you realize and you apply the way that can harm other people to it. So, for example, cigarettes were the coolest thing ever up until maybe about 1950. And then we realize that cigarettes are not only harmful to our own health, but harmful to the health of people around us, the people who ingest the smoke. So suddenly, overnight, cigarettes went from being okay if you weren't doing them and cool if you were to being bad. They were moralized just like that because they caused harm. And that's actually not a terrible thing. Sometimes it's important to moralize issues because issues are important and they do cause harm to other people. But I think what's happened is we talk about an issue that's moralized and the moralization bleeds upward into the conversation. So what I mean by that is two people can talk about an issue that's very contentious, like abortion, where morality applies very heavily. But the conversation itself is not a moral faux pas, if that makes any sense. I think that, well, the issue nowadays is that the conversation itself becomes a moral faux pas to 
it to begin discussion on certain issues is seen as morally right or wrong. To, and people are afraid of entering discussions because they know that to a, to a lot of people, merely ha holding a belief, holding a certain stance is is results in being judged morally, being set, seen as good or bad, being seen as somebody doing harm. I completely understand, but something I struggle with, I think, um, I agree with you, but I try to put myself in someone else's shoes when they're speaking to someone that they disagree with on a really, um, a, like, for example, important political topic, and the other person just has the complete opposite view. How do you get over that initial negative reaction to what they believe in and try to continue the dialogue without being like, yeah. I hate you. I think the trick there is just to always figure out where they're coming from, what we're talking about, coming, going towards their values. Like, why do they care about this subject? And then once you find what they value, you can identify with them on that and you can find a way that you can work together through those values. Yeah, and it, it takes a whole lot of self-control, for sure. A lot of self-control. And it doesn't help social media. doesn't help at all because you don't see anybody else's face. They're just this faceless avatar with some handle at something ridiculous. And you can just totally wreck them, and your friends will laugh. And yeah. it'll be hilarious. You're an online but, warrior. Yeah, exactly. I think the setting of the discussion means so, so much because it's all well and good for us to talk about, you know, really sitting down and trying to see where somebody is coming from. And you can do that when it's in a formalized setting of discussion or debate where both you and the other person, like you're face to face, you know what you're doing and you're seeking discussion. But so much of conversation about these contentious issues is not conducted in formal settings. It's just it comes up. You hear about someone's belief or they mention something. And it's and in I th think that that's what causes a lot of this issue is that there is not very much direct discussion between either side. It's one side hearing about, you know, somebody on the other side. I'm doing finger quotes in the air about sides because that's yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. I promise you. So doing I think th this is one of the things I've thought about as we've approached this podcast of realizing that actually sitting down with the intention of discussing is issues is very, very different than them just sort of coming up in your daily life or coming up when you're talking to people. Yeah, it's much easier when you're kind of aware of what you're going into. So it sounds like there's a theme between what Max and Guzal have said that you had mentioned, how do I talk to somebody when a conversation topic arises in a place where I was not ready for it? Or... When what they say really bothers me, and it's something I disagree with on a really strong level. And Addison mentioned to try to empathize with the other person, but that's hard to do, especially when you're in a state where you can't even deal with yourself. And what I found really helpful, and you guys might agree or anybody listening might find this helpful, is when I'm in a situation where I wasn't prepared to talk about something or anyone does anything that really causes a lot of strong emotions to rise in me, I empathize with myself before I empathize with anybody else. And it's been really helpful. And a good example of this, and it sounds weird, it does sound strange, when a lot of negative emotion arises or something strong happens, recognize it. Say, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable and I'm worried that these people won't accept me. And it's weird because it's not a problem you have to solve. You don't have to make them accept you. You just have to recognize it, if that makes any sense at all. I think it's I think it's really interesting that you comment on the lack of um, dialogue, and it's I I find that interesting the contrast between this lack of dialogue but the incredible increase in communication, mm -hmm. and how those are so fundamentally linked to each other is that I, I'd like to sort of break that down. Um, and I think it that. was you maybe someone mention the overture window overton window, overton window. Yeah. i think this i'm just gonna throw this out there it could possibly be that the two sides have a different overton window their windows do not overlap do you guys yeah. want to explain that yeah because i don't know do you yeah so the overton window is roughly the idea 
it's a domain of acceptable conversation the domain of topics that are acceptable conversation so for instance something that i think is a reasonable closing of the overton window is people making claims of ethnic superiority if people start to make claims of ethnic superiority i say no we're done here like this isn't a conversation this isn't a road we're going down again you know so both of the sides as the partisan hatred continued to grow their overton windows continued to shrink and it used to be in the 70s and the 80s we had much much more domain of topics in common with each other than we did not in common and now they're almost completely different like you said they're mutually exclusive overton windows at least for the more radical parts of either side so it's moved from one window almost to actually become two entirely separate windows Mm mm-hmm I've been, I've been, it's so cool hearing this from you guys because just talk about, you know, similar sorts of things that we like to think and talk about. This is an idea I've been working on for the last um, week or two is the idea that when there is access, when, when there is the potential for increased communication and 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 some sort of incentive around talking about contentious issues where you take a stand on them that that increased communication will inevitably lead the topic of discussion towards whichever base axioms are fundamentally inconsolable in that like if if and i'm thinking in terms of politics there is there's tremendous incentive to use contentious issues to develop a voter base to develop people that are behind you because that puts you in a position of power and so I, I've been thinking about this idea of, of how that just the fact that that's how that works, that's how the world works, that that means that discussion will inevitably be moved towards whichever discussion, whichever axiom you can fundamentally put someone in one camp or the other and demonize the other mm-hmm. side of that. Does that make any sense? So you think the closing of the Overton window is due to the mass communication? Yes, I think that when it's, I'm thinking it, um, I'm, let me draw an, like an evolutionary analogy of that when there is um, a niche that is available, um, an organism will evolve to, to fulfill that niche, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and do you guys know about mimetic, like meme theory yeah. and all that? Whatever, um, memes are, are ideas and they're, they propagate based off of how effectively they can propagate. In a, in a form of natural selection cat videos propagate because they're funny and they get you to share it and so the funnier cat videos are more likely to get you to sh- share them and so that's so th- they end up naturally evolving to to particular forms and all that and i think discussion and dialogue naturally tends towards things that people can't agree on that people are going to be on, on one side or the other because once you have an issue like that, that is fuel for somebody to be like, I believe in this side, follow me, believe in me, you can be in this camp, you can be in my tribe. Yeah, and I think that, hmm, I think that that got messed up a lot by social media and the simplifying of viewpoints because it used to be, if you work out, if you work out the game theory solution to how you should approach an election, the, the standard solution is you should be going for the median voter. You should be as moderate as possible because people, sh- like, people should look at your platform and vote based on which candidate's platform is closest to what I would like it to be, to, to my own ideas. So you usually go for the median voter because people are generally normally distributed. But I think social media and the bastardization of viewpoints because of the low bandwidth, like 140 characters in Twitter or something like that, has actually driven people toward the fringes. And it's replaced the the strategy that candidates use. It's no longer you go for the median voter, you rally your base into a fringe and then capture the fringe. One of the things I'd like to discuss was, uh, just to go back a little bit off the idea you took from Max and expanded on, when you said that things naturally conversation tends to naturally follow the points where we have disagreements and then push further from there 
And one of the things I've been thinking about also this last couple of weeks, I read a really interesting paper on the moralization of issues. So I think one of the things that's been happening recently that pushes us towards the fringe is rather than actually try to discuss issues, we moralize them. And a great example of this is the cigarettes in the 19, you know, I think 40s, 30s, 20s, maybe even the 50s. It was the coolest thing since sliced bread to smoke cigarettes, right? And then if you didn't smoke, it wasn't that big of an issue because people didn't care. But then once we learned that cigarettes have health consequences, it became a moral issue because you smoking a cigarette was dangerous to the health of the people near you. And that tends to be the core of moral issues. It's it's as if whenever your actions cause harm to other people, then it becomes a moral issue. So what we've done is we've taken that and we've applied it to really everything. So we take a political issue and we find the way in which this issue is harming people and we shout that as loud as possible. So one of the things I've seen recently is the idea that words are violence. And that's kind of scary. How did we get to that point, right? Because one of the things, one of the arguments behind the fact that people say, oh, words are violent. We shouldn't, you shouldn't talk about things that are offensive because it's, it harms people, right? So you, suddenly you've moralized words. And that's why we can get to the point where discussion actually is seen as dangerous because you've moralized the language. And then the argument becomes, I guess, you look a little further, you say, okay, so yeah, if you do undergo a lot of long-term stress, like if your life is stressful for a long period of time, it does shorten your health and it has a lot of consequences that manifest themselves physically, mentally, emotionally, you name it. So ideally, yeah, we can prevent people from undergoing long-term stress. But can you extrapolate that and say short-term stress is bad? And what the literature shows is no, you can't because we're actually developed to undergo short-term stress Mm -hmm. and that's how we grow. I I really liked how you unpacked that whole idea like scientifically and and like you broke that down really well. I think that's the sort of uh, communication that we should be looking for with. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it from that, from that point of view before. And it's just, yeah, how you approach it. Do we want to moralize issues or can we try to find the common ground? I guess that's my, one of my questions as I was hearing you is how, what is the alternative? Because I, the, a lot of these issues are political issues and, and government exists to, um, I mean, depending on your v- viewpoint, either be trying to make things better for people or prevent people from doing harm to each other and all of that. And so it seems inevitable that these things would that that dis- discourse would be around moralized issues. Yes. I guess what happens is we still want to be able to talk about issues that are moralized without moralizing the discussion itself. Oh, that's What neat. do you mean by that? So we can talk about an issue like you and me could debate, you know, something that's considered a hot topic nowadays. That's, Mm -hmm. I don't want to find an example. Abortion. Yeah, Yeah, abortion. (laughs) So we could talk about abortion, you and I. And that's a moral issue where we're going to have completely different axioms depending on where we stand as human beings. Right. However, I think what's happened is the the morality of that conversation has bled inward into the conversation itself. And then it suddenly becomes immoral to even discuss the topic itself. I I think that that connection of saying that the discussion itself, like having that discussion becomes a moral thing and and to and it feels like to uh, talk about an issue is something that is going to be seen as morally good or bad depending on and yeah. should that be the case or should that not be the case so this goes back to the overton window actually we're, we're kind of scratching on that and i think where we're at is we have to make a distinction between the overton window as like explicitly laid out with people in society like i gave the example earlier of somebody making a claim of ethnic superiority that's where most people would just flat out say no we're not going down that road so there's the overton window and then there's also the effective overton window okay which is what people feel like is okay to bring up at dinner or something like that (laughs) like like the thing my grandpa always says is if it, anything starts to get heated in the family about politics, he just goes, how about them cubs? <laughs> like, like that kind of stuff. Like we shouldn't have to do that. Yeah. Like we really shouldn't have to do that. And it would be better for our republic if we didn't have to do that. I think a good way to overcome some of the 
complications of that, of like moralizing a conversation, is to realize that to dig deeper and figure out what axioms, what axioms of values, I guess, you are really trying to protect. Right. Because I don't think anyone wants to kill babies because they want to kill babies or because they're yeah. selfish. They're mm -hmm. they're trying to protect something else that they see as more valuable. You might disagree on the perceived value of it, but everyone's trying to do good things in general. They just yeah. have different levels of which they believe are more valuable. Because a lot of the issues that get to such an explosive temperature, like a lot of the issues that people get really heated on, they're, people are getting heated on them because they're difficult issues to work through, usually because either way you make the decision, you're going to help one party and hurt the other. So, like, in the case of abortion, it's a very, very tough discussion to have because if you take the general left view, you're protecting the woman, the mother, but you're also hurting the child. You're making the sacrifice of hurting a potential child yeah. to help in a the mother. If you yeah. want to simplify it. Yeah. yeah, in a very simplified way. And then from the other side, you're protecting the child at the expense of the mother. Mm -hmm. But there's also, I just want to add this in there for those people who are thinking, there's also the people who think it's better for a child not to be raised in certain environments. If yeah, have to exactly. Deal with that. I don't want to get yeah. into that. But. So there's also, there's also a sense of there are different ways of protecting somebody. Yeah. But I think that that's the key is of the, what it comes down to is that to one side, it's not, it's not about, you know, protecting like a, a, a kid or, 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 or sorry, it's, it's not about protecting, um, a, like the woman. It's not about, it's not about the child's future and all that. It's just as simple as it's about killing a kid yeah. or on the other side, it's about that. It's not about killing a kid because it's not a kid yet, but it's, it's about causing a ton of harm to women. And, and when you have two people approaching a debate from those two points, there's nothing, there's no common ground there. There's no, because they're dis discussing, they're literally having two different discussions. They just happen to yeah. be talking at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jumping off of what you were just saying of, of breaking down to these values that underlie the issues, that's kind of been one of the the solutions I've seen to this lack of dialogue and discourse and all that is that I think that these individual issues blind us to a discussion of blind us from discussing underlying values. And I believe that these really, really contentious issues distract us from trying to figure out these underlying values, because I do think that's the approach to moving forward. However, I think that's really interesting what you say about how two people can have the same, exactly the same underlying values, but take them in two completely opposing directions. So that kind of, I don't know, like rebuts the sort of mentality that I've been having of, as of recently, which is more focused less on these super contentious issues and more on underlying values. Well, you can also, you can also start with a super contentious issue and then work back to the underlying values. And I think that's the only way to foster a constructive discussion is first find the common ground. And that's something we need to focus on in all of our discussions that we have is we see these discussions all the time, like turn on a cable news channel and you will see two people screaming over each other. Like you said, Max, having different conversations at the same time because they're starting with different axioms and their their axioms aren't squared. And that's not necessarily to say that we have to all have the same exact axioms, but we have to under, we never will, yeah, exactly. But we have to understand the axioms of who we're talking to. And we might have the same axioms, we might just hold certain axioms more important than others. And we might differ on which ones we think are more important. I think there is something to be said for, we're, we're talking about these contentious political issues. I think there's something to be said for just because you think something is wrong doesn't mean it has to be illegal. Like yeah. their law should not, culture has its place to influence value systems in ways that law just cannot if you want to have peace in a society. Yeah, absolutely. 
I think this is one of um, a really strong critique of the left at the moment is trying to make take a lot of issues and, and make them political legal issues where they might be better suited being explored culturally. Mm-hmm. But that, but again, that's because so much of what we're talking about are things where w- harm is involved, people being hurt, and all that. It's really tough to say when is when is it time for you know government to step in and enact law on, on things, and when is it something that the culture needs to evolve? What I'd like to see our culture, I don't like to use the word evolve and, you know, as if we're like, you know, somehow lesser than we will be in the future, but I'd like to see us kind of step back and go back to where we were almost. If I guess dialogue seemed to be a little more open, you know, previously, and then like you mentioned, since the 90s and probably even before that, there's been a lot of underlying political structures and philosophies and things building up to the point we are now, but when morality bleeds into language and we see language as violence, I think that's been one of the key things that I've repeatedly seen is people won't talk because of the possibility of offense. Yeah. And then, the, and that's okay, so let's, let's ask that question. What, is, it, is it more important to talk or to possibly not offend someone? And we can take that to the, to the very edge of its, of its ending. So as soon as, let's just say that it is more important to prevent someone from being offended than it is to discuss an idea because of the possibility that idea may offend that person. Now that might work with, you know, if I'm talking to one person say, okay, when I'm hanging out with Max, I'll just talk about things that don't offend him. And it might even work when I'm with five other people. But what about if I want to give a speech in front of a hundred people? Because I promise you there's going to be one person out of those hundred that my words just really rile up and totally offend. If I'm talking to a thousand people, definitely ten thousand. So when it reaches outwards and, and you, and it becomes more important to not offend people than it does to discuss ideas. Yeah, we reach really, really dangerous territory. I think this is where the, the as you have kind of stated, scale of discussion is really, really important. And I think that this is a way towards generally being happier people and all of that is realizing that that um, issues that affect the nation at large, that affect the culture at large, that are huge things, don't necessarily need to define your interaction with one other person. And that, but it is it's tough finding that balance between things need to be discussed, things need to move forward, and all of that. But also as individuals, I I don't I strongly believe that writ large a lot of these discussions around hyper politicized issues just create suffering in a lot of people's lives because they obsess over them and they use them to judge other people and it's really weird because half of me is like then the solution is well don't talk about it like don't let that be what your life is about focus on positive things but at the same time it's like so much of the issue comes from the fact that we don't talk about it. Yeah, I, and it's weird because in a in such a democratic state, we have we each have our own responsibility in some way. Like whether we act upon it or not, or whether we should act upon it or not, we each have a small power to change the laws of our nation. And so it's important to know it. There's like an inherent responsibility pushed upon people. And I'm not saying it necessarily should be there. But I'm saying it it just is there mm. right now, and I think that's why there's such. I I pushback. I'm going to present a maybe a bit of a contra- controversial stance mm-hmm. that maybe that, that there's a lot more that that's an illusion to an extent, and that that's a tool used by people in power to hyper politicize everything. If you convince everyone that their stance, their Facebook post about why immigration is bad or or why the wall is terrible and all that like is important that that's something that they need to express and all that 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 encourages people to be riled up and encourages people to be just have that be a constant thing that they're in that camp. Um and I, this this is actually going back way back to what we want to do with this podcast and why we want to what we want to do with this. One of the big reasons why I'm really excited about this podcast is because that's something I really don't know what the conclusion is. To what extent is it worthwhile to be invested and about contentious things writ large 
if it creates suffering, if it generates, if it causes you to look at people differently, if it causes you to be angry towards camps of people or just be dissatisfied with the world. I don't know. And that's, I think for Max, that's one of the biggest things I want to try and figure out through this podcast. Yeah. That's something that's very difficult. And it's, it's something that I want to address and I think needs to be fixed because what I see the state being right now is that social media and the outreach that social media gives simplified viewpoints and the outreach that it gives radicals specifically has shifted all of the voice power to radicals essentially and then everybody that I know who's a really level-headed good person has completely removed themselves from politics because it's too much of a headache and I don't want this to be a headache for people if we want our republic to continue doing well and to prosper in the long term not just make it through my life but make it through my children's and my grandchildren's lives if we want that to happen we have to make this not necessarily enjoyable for people it'll always be hard it's always going to be hard to get yourself to see like somebody else but we have to make it a positive challenge for people we have to convince people that this is a way that you can grow you can become more nuanced you can understand the world in a better way by participating in this process and at the same time it upholds the health of our republic and i want to bring those good people those quiet good people back into the conversation so that they can broadcast their practical solutions to things what they what they might see that i might not see because i have a different point of view yeah and not what the most radical of either side sees yeah i think this goes back to us our one of our purposes purposes is not to change people's viewpoints but is to figure out is to allow people to be able to express their viewpoints more articulately so that we may find pathways where people can work together we can find out where they mesh and where we can act yeah i think it's so interesting hearing this all because what it's making me think is that wow like what communication and dialogue is and the difference between communication per se and dialogue because i'm now kind of confronting that what i think of as being you know debate discussion contention all that so much of it is wrapped up in you know twitter or 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 broadcast news or or you know people arguing on reddit or things like that and that that's what my conception of of communication is becoming that that's what my conception of dialogue is becoming and of course i'm resistant to it because that is it is gross it's short there's no you know and and so i think it's that's actually really really beautiful um what you're just saying eric of of making dialogue something positive again and I think exactly what we're doing here of, of making ourselves confront that in long-term storytelling. It's cool that I'm like really seeing your vision with this now. I really like that. I really, really like that. You guys that. helped me develop it because I just had this horribly underdeveloped idea in my brain <laughs> fermenting there for months. And I finally got in contact with all of you guys. So and you guys what you're saying is this out. dialogue helped you. Dialogue Whoa. helped me develop my ideas, <laughs> believe it or not. Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> Max, I wanted to step back a little earlier. It's something I've been sitting with since you spoke about it. Earlier, you had talked about trying to find that median between trying to deal with today's consent, like uh, contentious issues while also remaining oh, far enough away from it that you remember we're human and you try to pay attention to those positive values we all share and how to find the, the middle ground for that. And one of the things that comes to mind is, I guess, the level at resol of resolution at which we see people and also how we understand stressors. I should probably start with the stressor part. So one of the things that's popular today is the idea that having offensive discussion is stressful to people. And we know that long-term stress is, has negative consequences. But the psychological literature shows that Short-term stress is actually the only way to become resilient and survive in the world. And a great example of this is if someone has a horrible fear of elevators, 
uh, one of the first things that you do with them is you start off a brand in your office and showing them pictures of elevators on Google until that becomes boring. And then once that's boring, you say, okay, are you ready to stand near an elevator? And they say, yes. Or maybe they say no and they need a little more time. But once they're ready to step up to standing near an elevator, as soon as they get near it, their heart rate's going to jump and they're going to be stressed out and it's going to be uncomfortable. But eventually that becomes boring because while it was a short-term stressor, our bodies are adapted to accept short-term stressors and overcome them. And then eventually the person can step in the elevator and then eventually they can go up and down it so many times that it becomes a normal task. And so even though in their mind before they did that process, they knew, yeah, I can't stand in an elevator. They, their body didn't physically know it. So one of the things I'd like to do is articulate the idea that short-term stressful dialogue is actually helpful. So when you listen to things that cause you emotional pain and emotional angst, use that as a, as a reason to say, okay, this is really, I can use the word triggering, but I don't mean it in the sense that we tend to nowadays. Something is triggering an emotional response in me, and this is good. This, this, is, this is me. This is part of me expressing myself without me knowing it because that's what an intense emotional response is. It's part of you expressing yourself without your will in a sense, mm. and you learn more about yourself during that process. Yeah, and it's not the most comfortable thing, but it's living. It's truly living and growing. Something that's not growing is dead. And then as we become more comfortable doing that, we become more resilient human beings who can survive. And I become extremely concerned as I see this culture promoting safe spaces. And I understand the idea. I, I would love if everyone could be safe all the time. And if we had a world where safety was guaranteed to everybody and where we could all just be comfortable being in the world. But that's not what the world is. It's, it's a harsh reality we live in. And by preventing yourself from accepting that and removing yourself from it, what that does psychologically is when you're really anxious about something and you continually avoid it, the more you avoid it, the more that tells your body subconsciously, I'm avoiding this because I can't overcome it or because this will kill me or because this is more dangerous. It's just as dangerous as I think it is. And as long as we continue to promote the idea that what we think is dangerous is actually just as dangerous, if not more dangerous than we think it is, I think the worse this issue gets, if that makes any sense. I think another one of the central issues we're facing is it's funny. We talk so much about dialogue um, and how much dialogue has decreased as communication has increased, as digital communication has increased. The fact that we, we, there's so much more communication between people nowadays over the Internet, and yet it feels like the level of dialogue has gone so much down. And for me, I think that they're they're absolutely related um, and this gets into something I, th I think we've spoken a little bit about before, the bandwidth problem, the idea that when communication is limited to, to smaller, you know, chunks of text, tweets or short videos or things like that, the, the amount of information you can actually communicate, you can get across in these communications when that is so much decreased, the quality of the discourse goes way, way down. And as these online sources have become our primary means of communication, we've throttled our ability to accurately express ideas with each other. What do you guys think about that? Beyond just social media, that extends to, to media itself, where you only have five or ten minutes to discuss a really complex and nuanced issue. And generally, the media company that's doing it is going to have a bias, which is fine. Everyone has a bias. But when you only have a few minutes to jam a really complex conversation in, yeah, it leaves a lot of important information out and it seems to rile people up and give us a negative view of the world. So this bandwidth problem that we've been talking about is one of the main reasons that we started doing podcasts. See, podcasts are really an anomaly in the digital age in that they have the highest capacity to carry nuanced information to people. Which is kind of wild when you think about it. Like, I don't know that different different forms of communication are, are can literally convey more or less ideas, and I think it's interesting. Podcasts they kind of feel like this mundane thing, you know. It's like you're just there's not as much sensory stimuli going along with it, but that forces them to be engaging through simply effectively conveying ideas. There's no flashy element or or whatever. It's, it's storytelling. That's kind of cool. Now I'm thinking about storytelling, like <laughs> how that's been, how that's such a human thing. And, and, uh, 
And this is our, our modern version of that. That's kind of cool. And you really don't have to pay a whole lot of attention. Like you can be running, you can be doing the dishes or something. Or you can be running and, and doing the dishes if you're really good. Exactly. <laughs> and listening to our podcast. <laughs> yeah. And you can be doing all this stuff. And this gives us the time to really unpack complicated ideas. We're able to convey so much more information in such a shorter period of time. For example, when you send a text to someone, they will never understand if you're being sarcastic or if you're angry or if you're sad unless you spell it out for them. But here, as you're listening to me, you can tell I'm... Just pissed off. (laughs) Mad at the world. Exactly. And it, it doesn't take much time for you to listen, but it takes time for you to read. It's strange, too, that podcasts have picked up because, as you mentioned, yeah, it is more of a passive listening. But in a sense, it's more active as far as engaging thought and ideas in your mind. You know, while texting is active with your fingers, it's a little less active with going in depth and thinking about just complex topics. And what I've been really thinking about lately that fascinates me is the fact that podcasts even picked up. Because 10 years ago, we really had this conception that what we wanted maybe even just five years ago was quick fast media that doesn't have a lot of information or short small sweet and quick but what we've realized is we have podcasts like the joe rogan podcast that has billions of listens which is fascinating because nobody would have predicted it yeah it's also cool i think it's 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 a testament to how powerful podcasting is when you realize that there's very rarely any sort of a monetary element to it you don't make money making podcasts please uh send your donations to us yeah yeah Yeah, um but like it's there's not an economic incentive for it and yet it's still this flourishing form of media because we need it because it it fills that niche of long form storytelling yeah it's something we crave i was watching a an informative informative video not to hate on podcasts today um (laughs) but it was talking about how there were multiple different forms of of homo not homo sapiens but humanoid creatures and the reason we went out is because of our of how we communicate of how we tell stories and how we can form ideas through that you can pass down knowledge yeah it's like the the other no go ahead oh what i was about to say i apologize to cut you off was before we had text before we even had books how did we communicate it was through verbal communication it was talking and telling stories that is our fundamental manner in which we understand the world or maybe if you go really far back before we had words i guess you could get really you know fundamental i i think there's a case to be made that words i mean that they're what make us human they're they're yeah I, okay that's kind of cheap <laughs> well that makes a really good point actually because what Thank you. What the literature has shown, the psychological literature, is that what happens to your brain when you have a conversation is the same thing that happens when you're typing out a book. It's actually really, really fascinating to see that when you talk to people and you know that there's people around you listening to what you're saying, you can continue an idea and just go deeper and deeper into it more than you could if you were trying to think to yourself. And that's a strange phenomenon because the only difference between you being by yourself and trying to think without getting lost in your mind is the fact that you're articulating it out loud and have another conscious human being listening to you. All right. So one of our main goals with Odin was after we discussed the topic for a little while to try and bring a takeaway to you guys. So is there any of, anything any of you have learned during this conversation or any little takeaways that you could share? I think one thing that's really important, not necessarily from this conversation, but just something to do in general to practice dialogue a little bit more, is to let your inner monologue just voice itself a little bit more. You know, if you're sitting next to somebody on a bench and you just notice something around you, just comment on it if something pops into your head. Those little things that pop into your head, just voice them. It can be a little scary because you're probably going to say something stupid. But most of the time, it's just funny if you say something stupid. My little tip of the day or tip of the night is um, you, you're more inclined to voice your opinions and engage in dialogue if you 
if you feel confident in that it's a well-educated opinion. So when you find a topic you're passionate about, when you find something you want to talk about with someone for an extended period of time, just do your homework, do a little research, be more confident in what you're trying to say and what you're trying to engage in, and you're going to want to talk about it. Yeah, it makes it fun. That's good. That's true. (laughs) That's true. That's true. I for long, um, I've um, just on that topic, like, I love every time rich, every time you're like in the psychological papers, like that always, I always, I always really appreciate that. Um, my, my big takeaway was just sort of realizing how disconnected I had become from discourse because I've let it become this thing that I don't participate in. It's this ugly thing that's always on my phone that I hear about on the news or something like that. And, but I, I, I do not often enough actively participate in discourse. So I think, um, Re- learning to reframe it as a positive thing that I can participate in and feel good about and learn and come away from. I think that's really cool. And I'm, I'm already, I mean, I already feel great just having been able to talk about all this stuff with you guys. I know we've talked a lot about growth and getting our ideas out there and discussing them, being more open with our dialogue. But I also think it's important for your growth to take time off, let yourself process these things maybe turn your phone on airplane mode and don't turn it back off until you've gone through a little bit of the morning just to let yourself have that time to yourself. I think that balance, that balance is something that we'll we'll definitely be exploring in future episodes. Stay tuned for spaciousness. (laughs) And uh, my takeaway, I guess I'd like to give you guys a, a, maybe a way to help implement the things we just talked about. So, after you've listened to Guzal and done a lot of research or, you know, listened to Eric and decided, hey, I kind of want to voice myself. But as you're about to do that, you start to feel anxious or tense or maybe you're worried about what the person next to you is going to think. Slow down and remember that everything's going to be all right. Pay attention to that anxiety or that worry or anything that arises and accept it because that's you and empathize with yourself. And hopefully with a little bit of that, we can have a lot, a bit of good world. hey everyone thanks for listening if you liked our podcast please tell your friends and if you're interested in joining check us out on gobble connect or talk to us at any of our public meetings we're looking for creative people who are willing to help with the production side of things business development and if you have your own ideas we're always open to new playlists